From Hamster Wheel Publishing, this is Blunt Dissection. I'm Dave Nicol. In today's podcast, I visit the Royal Vet College London to talk with five vet students ready to start their careers. We talk vet school life, student debt, job expectations, and get the student view on corporate versus independent practice. This episode is essential listening for anyone interested in how the next generation of vets thinks. So sit back and enjoy the conversation with the class of 2017. Okay, so I'm at the Royal Veterinary College, uh, Potter's Bar, um, in London. It's a fabulous day outside. The birds are keeping away, and I am joined by, I'm not sure what the collective for a, uh, a group of RVC students is, perhaps we can come up with a name for that by the end of this, um, but I'm joined by five uh, final year RVC vet students. Um, so guys, we'll just go around the room, and I shouldn't say guys, because very reflective of the profession. <laughs> I've got four girls and one guy, so we're seriously outgunned here. Um, but let's maybe go around the room and you guys introduce yourselves, and, um, and yeah, we'll start off like Hi, I'm Emma, and I'm looking to go into a small east job when I finish in July, hopefully. Um, hi, my name is Molly. I'm Chloe. I'm Nicola. And I'm Gamma. Okay, awesome. Um, well, thank you very much. I appreciate this. Is, this time of year, uh, vet students across the UK, probably North America, like anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere, are studying like crazy for finals. Um, so what's the, what's the level of stress in the room at the moment? Like, how are you guys feeling? About fifty percent stress currently. That's pretty. That's I'm like I am so surprised to hear that. How far out are you from? When when are the final dates and what's the structure of your final year at the moment? Like the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh of June. So about seven weeks, and it's four written exams. Yeah. Um, yeah. So not too bad. It's going to get worse close to the date, I reckon. Yeah, the, 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 we crank up the yeah. crank up the levels. And you've done your pracs already, is that right, your practical stuff? Yeah. Okay. So the purpose today, and um, blunt dissection is generally we follow the course of the path of success and we sort of deconstruct people within the veterinary industry who've done some pretty cool things and try and work out the patterns and beliefs and the various inputs that arrived, that helped them arrive at their success and map out the journey. What seemed really relevant for two reasons is that every journey starts somewhere and you know vet school the source of graduate vets is the start point of that professional journey notwithstanding the fact that everyone wants to be a vet for many years before you, you qualify um, so I wanted to come up here and, and speak with the next generation of vets and also because new graduate vets are a pretty hot topic in the industry at the minute um, particularly bearing in mind the corporatization and there seems to be a lot of competition for the, your attention you'll be very glad to hear um, that, that perhaps didn't exist in the past so I wanted to explore that and really give the listeners who are likely to be practice owners uh, managers leaders an insight into where you guys are coming from um, so maybe Gareth we'll start with you um, give me a little background on on why you set out to become a vet when you decided you wanted to be a vet and and you know, if we can do that in under two hours that would be a, <laughs> a very good thing. Um, I think I wanted to be a vet from quite a young age but I went through a period probably in the early teens that it was clear that's what I wanted to do. I think I had that sort of wobble everyone does like age 15, do you want to be a vet, do you want to be a doctor, which is I guess because they're very similar professions they both have that problem solving and helping um, but then I did decide that after doing work experience that I wanted to be a vet, um, and yeah, so that's a really approach there I went through, and that's when I started focusing on. Was there a particular moment that you can identify where you, you know you flipped sides and said, "Yeah, oh, it's going to be better and not medicine." Um, I think it's looking going to vet practices and seeing that, unlike medics, where they begin to so focus down to one particular thing, and they may say if they come off, orthopedic surgeon just do left knee replacements. You go and see these vets. The first morning they'd be doing consultations from um, older animals all, all the way through to neonates, and then in the, after, in the afternoon maybe doing a spay, maybe doing neutering, or maybe doing more complicated surgery like a TPLO or stuff like that. So it's the ability to have multiple disciplines you can you can master instead of being so focused and so narrow-minded that some, unfortunately some of our medical counterparts have to go down because the way they're 
their profession is, is structured. Right, they, they reach that vanishing point of knowing yeah. absolutely everything about absolutely nothing, yeah. effectively, right? Um, is that is that something that you guys have in common? Is that what pulled you towards? Does anybody feel like, is there a different origin story for any of you? I, I had the same kind of thought process of going uh, doctor or vet, but um, apart from the fact that people are gross, <laughs> um, <laughs> compared to animals, I think the challenge of the fact that your patient can't tell you what's wrong with them is a really good thing to, and challenging yourself all the way through life is what keeps you interested. So if someone can come in and say, oh yeah, my tummy hurts, you're like, okay, great. But to work out and go through the problem solving and all of that kind of stuff interests me much more. So. And I'm, I bet you if there wouldn't be any doctors if people had anal glands, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> <laughs> like, I think that goes without saying. Right? <laughs> so paint me a little bit of a picture. I went to Glasgow University. And so I don't recall any of my veterinary school background at all because it was all in the pub. Um, <laughs> paint me a little bit of a, a backdrop, like weave the tapestry of what life is like at the RBC. It's very different in because we do the first two years in Camden and then we moved to Potter's Bar for the clinical years, so years three, four, five. Um, so is that a major culture shock? Because it's very leafy and green out here <laughs> and Camden, if I yeah. recall, is uh, quite out there and fun and happening and lively. It's very different and I think there are really good things about both of them. Like when we lived in Camden, we lived in a really quite small house and we had a great time in Camden. Um, And the course, as well as the sort of social side of things, is totally different because it feels like the first couple of years of a BSc degree. It doesn't actually feel that clinically relevant and I think now looking back you can see things that were important. but I do remember moving to Potter's Bar and thinking, okay, I'm learning to be a vet now. I'm not learning sort of some random immune system pathway that doesn't seem relevant to anything. Um, and I mean, the fact that we have a much bigger house out here is quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're already sort of spreading your wings and moving to the suburbs. Yeah, yeah we became <laughs> 50 quite here. quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and what branch of medicine do you want to go into? Um, I actually want to go into equine practice. Yeah, no, because so the country is just dragging you out. <laughs> you're, you're really happy with yeah. that, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so what's the, what does a typical day in the life look like? I mean, it's, you know, we, we've just been talking before we shot about your intriguing breakfast options, which for the <laughs> record are all cake or confectionery based. <laughs> uh, so I already worry for all of your long, ongoing health and pancreatic <laughs> disease. But pay me the life... You know, a, a day in the life. Um, perhaps Nicola, you, um, what is it, what does a day in the life of an RBC student today look like? Um, well, at the moment it's quite revision heavy, but um, in I don't know. We sort of get up, go to lectures. Um, what, what time do you, do you normally get up? I'm quite an early bird, but I think I'm I think I'm in the minority doing that. Yeah. But throughout the years, lectures probably usually started at nine. Most of us managed to get there, I think. We had the odd few that would roll in and eat their breakfast while yeah. while they were writing notes. Um, like I did on the train on the way up here this morning. <laughs> and then in the afternoon we would, well, the evenings and in Camden, we'd like, go out and have more of a social side. And yeah. I do think in the earlier years we managed to keep a work-life balance a bit more. Um, go into more about what you mean by that. Um, as in making sure that you're not just always studying and yep. always just doing vet things I think yep. it's important to make sure that you have a bit of a life as well otherwise yep. like, people aren't machines we need to like, have fun as well What percentage of your time now certainly as you approach the end of your degree what percentage of the time is work and what percentage of the time is play and maybe you all have different answers to that mm-hmm. <laughs> I see some heads nodding and grinning. Um, I think maybe 60, 40, 60 work and 40 play. Yep. But that might be, I probably, if I tried a bit harder, I probably could make that 50 50. If I, I think I do a lot of worrying about things that if I just got on and did it, I'd yep. have it done. Yep. Um, and then I'd have more time to do fun things. But I think 
And maybe it is more than that. I don't really know. <laughs> what's, let's go around the table on that one. So what's your, and there's no right or wrong answer here, but so what's your, what are your impressions on that work-life balance? Um, I think it depends what particular part of the course. I think when you're in the lecture-based, uh, so years one to first part of year four, you can get more uh, social life. I was pretty good at I tried work between nine and five, so break times in uni where I had to have a lecture, do work, and have the evenings off to do what I wanted to do. I think when you go into the clinics, it's a bit trickier. I think it's very rotation dependent. Some you have you feel like you have barely no time, yeah. and others you are able to have some more of a life. And I think it also depends on what time of the year. So I know a lot of us made more time at the beginning of September because everyone's going back to see people, stuff like that. But maybe mid November, no one really wants to do anything because everything's tired, the days are getting darker. I think it really fluctuates, but yeah, I think 60 40. Uh, maybe 70, 30 on some rotations. So you're painting um, a pretty rosy picture and given, it's, I'm not going to ask you if you're super happy here, but you've enjoyed the course, it's been a, it's, you, it's, you'll feel like it's been the right decision for you going through the course. Definitely. Yeah. Um, if you had your time again to do it again, would you, would you do it? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Do you feel more or less strongly about that than when you started? I'm not getting every nodding here today. So the yeses, the, the strong yeses, nobody's in a shake of the head no so far, but the strong yeses, what has formed that opinion? And we'll come to the rest of you guys in a second. I suppose um, thinking about the RBC coming here, I think we can all agree that it's such a community-based university. I think cause it's quite a small one, and I don't know how many people there are here, I'd say, top 10, 2,000 students. Yeah. You do find that everyone seems to know who everybody is. You're all in the same club, so you meet people from all across the years and all across the courses. How and many people are in a year at present? Um, I think in our, in our year we have about 220. Yep. So when you spend five years together and you're all mixing together in groups and clubs and you know, if there's a night out in London, chances are most of the year will go, so then you get to know who everybody is, and it means that you've always got someone you can go and sit with, or you've always got someone you can chat to, and, and it kind of means that all of the staff know who we are as well, yep. so it's it makes things really approachable, and you just feel really comfortable here, so I definitely say RBC is quite, for me, was, was a good choice. Yeah, okay. I think that obviously most people when you apply to vet school you don't really get a choice of university you kind of get given one and you yep. accept it and you're over yep. the moon grateful yep. um what but going through rbc even like yesterday i was watching a vet program on the telly and they referred to rbc and i was like oh i know that person which, I worked which with. program was it um the vet on the hill okay um and they referred to neurology and they worked with someone that um, I'd done my rotation with and I thought, oh my God, this person's on telly and I've worked with that person and I felt really proud the fact that I'd gone to a university that is so renowned and has been on telly and yeah. all of that kind of stuff. So. And I, I, I should ask you this at the top of the interview, How did, did you all, where are you all from in the country? Um, I'm kind of from West London area. Yep. So you're in so, your backyard. Yeah, so I'm kind of far enough away that my parents can't descend every day, <laughs> but near enough that when I run out of money and I want to go home, I can go home and steal all the food and come back. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, and Molly? Um, I'm from about 40 minutes north of here. Great. Yeah, I'm from kind of around here towards Watford Way, so I'm mm-hmm. from Essex. Essex? And I'm from Kent. And you're from Kent? Yeah. Which part of Kent? Uh, West Kent, near Seven Oaks. Yeah, okay. I used to, uh, my first... First job, in, uh, second job in England was in Sitka. Um, oh, cool. Very near Seven Oaks. So. Is that part of it? That's part of it. That is indeed, yes. So you were very happy that you made the choice to come here and felt like you would make that choice again. Is that right, Nicole? Yeah, I mean, I... I There's head nodding going on from you as well. Yeah, in terms of the choice to come here, yeah. I only had one offer. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really make a choice. Right. But I do think it has been... I have really enjoyed it. I really like that um, everyone here is doing something vetty. 
So it really builds on the community type thing, although it does mean that when I go home or go out with friends that aren't Betty, my dinner conversation is not... Um, I sometimes forget to filter, like, oh, people are eating, they might not want to know about that. Basically yeah. gross. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you just gust your friends. Like, that's okay, we get, we get that, that's all right. But, um, yeah, I, I've really enjoyed my time here. Yeah. yeah. And how, how do you feel about, you know, now that you're at the end of the course, um, would you do it again? Would you, if you had to tell yourself or give yourself some advice, what would that advice be? Um, it's hard to say no because I have loved it, but I do think if I had my time again, I would do human medicine. What pushed you? And I'm getting nods from Gareth here as well. Um, so that's interesting, given that initially you you were interested in the variety. Um, so what has swayed you in the other direction now? Um. I don't know, part of it, and it sounds very, very shallow, is a financial thing. Yep. Um, so, obviously, doctors tend to, not in their sort of first couple of years, but their career progression is quite a lot greater than yep. vets. Yep. Um, I also, I don't really know, I like that we're generalists, and obviously you can become a specialist, but I think in some ways it's limiting, and I think that the scope of things that you can do in the human field is so much greater um, that really quite interests me um, and in terms of vet schools although I've loved RBC and in so many ways it's it's a very easy place to you've got something in common with everyone but I feel like I could have been sort of more challenged or met a sort of broader variety of people if I'd gone to a university that did other courses as well because right. we're all very similar we're all from very similar backgrounds and that's so relaxing and so easy but it's not very challenging. I would think that listeners will have no idea who's speaking at what point, and I should probably start sub signposting names or things, because <laughs> every, everyone is from basically within the home counties that surround London. Um, and here we are, we're all sat, um, you know, probably all from you know, reasonably well-to-do families. Um, we're all white. Um, I'm not English, obviously, but I've lived for the majority of my life in England. So I certainly there's an, there's an element of homogenisation going on, right? Um, Gareth, as the token male student. Um, I think uh, part of it is very similar to what Molly said, that um, I love being, in, being here and making great friends, but I wish I'd been challenged in that multi-faculty university more, um, because as much as it's great sometimes going home and having people know what you've gone through and have something in common, it's also sometimes be nice to go home and not have to talk about that stuff. Actually have, and I guess you get more exposure to different things, different cultures, different, different interests for people outside of this field, because we all have quite a lot of similar interests. As much as we might have different extracurricular activities we do, yeah. we're all very similar in that sense. And mine is also in medicine, I think there's, um, that's what I might think of doing again, is there's a more structured career progression that yeah. you don't... Um, come out after four or five years and then for a lot of people that might hit be your ceiling because nowadays you can't really become a practice partner as easily and specialism is so competitive to get into yeah. like recently they had three small animal surgery residencies open to QMH and they had something like 140 applicants yeah. all who've done five years in practice done two internships certificates in small animal surgery and that's the sort of competition there is to become a specialist yeah, in the human medicine where they have their very nice structured junior doctor program, registrar training program, so eight, it maybe takes eight to ten years, but yep. you can get to where you want to be. So, I've certainly heard recently that I've seen debate recently about what the future of specialisation looks like, um, because that's you know not everybody can be a specialist, and I think that there, there may be a problem for specialists in that you know supply and demand specialists believe it or not, don't want too many specialists because then there's not enough work for specialists. Um, but equally, um, you know, there aren't the number of training positions available, regardless of who wants anything or likes anything. You know, there just aren't that massive number of training slots, as you, as you say. So do you see the advanced practitioner certificates as being a route, and that's, in that's what the Royal College intends as the framework for post-graduation study and development. Um, how do you guys feel about that? I mean, it's definitely something that I um, intend to do. 
Um, I intend to do it in exotics yep. um, purely because it broadens my options as opposed to if you specialise in something like cardiology or neurology or something, then you are more likely to be focused on those things um, and it potentially makes your field of view narrower. Um, whereas I think exotics opens everything up, so that's why I want to do that. But you, I've spoken to a fair few um, other vets that have been working for years, and they're starting, because everyone's starting to do them, they're starting to have a more negative view on the fact that it's just going to be something that everyone has a certificate in 10 years' time, and it's not going to be of any value. Yeah, right, so how do you differentiate yourself mm. in that space? Um, how many of you have jobs as of now? Yeah, I have a job um, in Watford as a small lab law um, person. So yeah. We have a, a practice that has that. So that's Chloe speaking. Yeah. And um, is that with a practice that will have an exotic spectrum now? Have you got one eye no, on that so, at this stage? No, so they, um, they potentially kind of employed me um, based on the fact that my one of my interests was in was exotics, yep. um, because that's an area that they wanted to pursue, um, so I think that is potentially why that I got the job there. So. Okay, and so two out of five have jobs at the minute. Uh, the other three, actually, Molly and Gareth, I had a question for both of you, which was, um, are you going to or are you considering retraining? and going back and doing a medical degree? I have looked into it. It frustrates me a bit that the shortest postgraduate programme you can do is four years. So that would be, I'd be in the same position as someone who'd done a biology degree, although I think I've probably got a lot more relevant experience. Right. Um, financially, I couldn't do it for a few years at least, but it's not something that I'd rule out. Um, I have also looked into it, but I think I'll I'm going to have a look and see actually what's real life at work compared to the university field and maybe I'll actually enjoy it a lot more. Um, and I'm not that I've enjoyed it, but that those sort of worries or concerns will be at the minute. Also, I'm also very conscious looking at what's happening regarding the whole fear of junior doctors and the medical profession in NHS at the moment. That's not also the most, it's quite a toxic environment it seems, and it doesn't seem like the best sort of uh, place to go into if I was going to do it now. Um, right. Because to do, to say I did work as a vet for a couple of years, then did four years training, so ten years down the line, is the NHS going to be in the same way it is now? Am I going to have, still have these sort of training opportunities around? And I know recently back in Kent that they had to pull something like 120 junior doctors out of a hospital because they didn't have enough specialist consultants to uh, do enough structured training for them, for them to be safe. And if that's happening all over in places like in the South East in Kent, where there's a lot more money for that compared to happening other NHS practices or trusts around the UK, that's going to be a major right. uh, sticking point. And I think we have spent six, well, I spent six years here studying to become a vet, and I love it. I just need to actually get out and do it, and maybe a wee spark and get exactly what I want to do. How well prepared do you feel at this stage to get out there? You hear the Royal College talking about day one competencies. How well prepared do you all feel at the moment? I think it's really hard to know. Um, I know certainly for myself, um, if I talk to everyone else in the year, you know, what have you been doing on your placements? Um, how many surgeries have you been able to do? Everyone varies a lot. And I think for me, I have no idea how I am doing in comparison to everyone else. I mean, I suppose, I mean, we're all friends in here, but so we'll be honest. But a lot of the time people want to tell you about the amazing things they've done and they won't always tell you the other side of things. So I think... For me, I hear everyone telling me, oh, I, I did my first ever pio the other day, and I'm thinking, oh no, like, I've barely even done half a bitch space. I think for me, I have absolutely no idea where I stand in comparison to the rest of the graduating year, but I don't know if that's just me or if everyone else has that sort of impression. I think surgery is one of those things that people get so hung up on and I think it's because it's exciting and because everyone wants to tell you about the first bitch day that they've done on their own with nobody else scrubbed in but I think really once you get into practice you're going to be doing those sorts of things quite a lot and it's something that everyone in a year's time is probably going to be on exactly the same page with and I think the thing that 
people don't think about as much because it it's not such sort of bravado as the whole actually working through a case. I think being able to work through, say, a difficult medicine case and having a logical approach to it is more important at our stage than having done, I don't know, a caesarean on your own. <laughs> but that's what everyone talks about, so that's what's easy to get hung up on. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like, when I was applying to jobs, I spoke to the vet that I take my animals to, and she said, basically, if you can do a bitch there, you're hired. Um, so that was kind of, again, putting the pressure on the fact that you need to be doing surgery. But then you think about things like, I've seen a lame dog come in a hundred times, but if it was me doing it, I know probably what drug I'd give it, but do I know how long for? Do I know when I want to see it back, if I want to see it back? Do I know if I want to do x-rays now or in a week's time? And it's these kind of things that you only really learn by watching other people do it or when we're let loose and have to do it ourselves. So it's those kind of things that you think they're the the important things that we're going to need to know on day one that I definitely don't feel prepared for. And for me, the way my rotation plans have worked is that I had a lot of my EMS very early on. So my last actual abdominal surgery did on my own was last June, July. Yeah, that'd be a year for the point of graduation. So yeah. I've done a, a, a cat or dog spay or assisted yeah. in that. Uh, and, I think that's, and I think also, as much as seeing referral practices is amazing, it does skew our approach. Like, you're not going to every medicine case come in and do a complete blood workup, do, or do an abdominal ultrasound as standard. And I think that's going to take a bit of time for me switching back out of that referral setting back into general practice, yeah. where sometimes you'll you're, do symptomatic treatment to see okay, does it respond to treatment in 48 hours? Because I think sometimes we forget that's actually a diagnostic test in itself. If it responds to treatment, it, it directs our approach. And I guess, yeah, that, that's going to take some time getting used to back to that sort of first, first opinion. You've got, you've got like the, you've got the rarefied atmosphere of the college environment with layered on top. Really the, the sort of student ego equivalent of the, the filter on the selfie, right? You know, only, people only ever tell you about the awesome stuff they've been doing, not the fact that they dropped six stumps and nearly, you know, dog nearly bled out and they passed out on the old table. But that, that doesn't appear on their Facebook feed, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's hard. Does, it, does social media make that sort of thing harder? Like, when I was a student, it didn't exist. Yeah, because, um, you know, certainly when we did all of our first placements, we were all going off, people would, I mean... We're, we're always told not to unless you have permission. Um, but people might take a picture of a surgery that they've helped in, post it on social media and say, I've just done this, when really they've maybe done one part of it, which is great um, to be able to get involved. Which is Luke can take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, um, but then you think, oh, I haven't done that. Um, yeah. You know, and people... I mean, it's nice because it means you can keep up to date with what everyone's doing because half the time on rotations we barely see each other at all. So it's, it's yeah. nice in a way, um, but sometimes it can kind of have that similar effect and it can kind of cloud your own expectations of yourself. Yeah. Um, but I suppose we're all guilty of, if we're proud of something, we will tell everyone about it right. and, right. you know, blow your own trumpet a little bit. <laughs> but I suppose sometimes, yeah, it can, can muddle you a small amount. Um, that sort of feeds into... Um, Maybe the topic of stress and anxiety, which is something I know that students can, well not just students, but vets in general, struggle with. Is this, a, is, you know, has the course been stressful? Are there points where, you know, it, it's been, you've thought about, you know, this isn't for me? Um, or has it been something that's, you know, but I said, was my 51% approach to passing exams, I never felt particularly like, terribly stressed unless I happen to get 29% in the exam that was a bit more stressful but um, you know that high achiever that sort of almost that sort of um, tall poppy sort of syndrome um, do you guys experience that as students um, you know, what do you experience um, in terms I think of stress for me it's a lot of it is it's not made stress that I'm getting I'm, I'm suffering from it I put a lot of pressure on myself to meet these goals I want so I'm one of those sort of people that mentioned earlier before before we start recording that I would like to get on this because I've got distinction every year. I put the work in and the way the honor system works here is you have to get so many points of funny is you basically have to do well in the final exams. Um, 
it's a bit annoying because you could all that work beforehand is basically neglected. Yeah. But um, so I'm putting pressure on myself because I want to do it, not because it's going to help me in the future, but merely because I want to see. I've challenged myself. Can I do it? And that's probably why I'm doing more work at the moment in my vision than maybe some other people are doing because that's the pressure I put myself. That's my target. Yeah. But I think it's something that's probably uh, throughout the vet schools. Everyone, as you said, the high achievers coming in, they put themselves. They put these unrealistic targets. I remember in first year being like, I must learn every single thing and not get. And then didn't take to half a few seconds to realise you can't know it all. And then life is so much easier when you accept you can't know it all and then you make a targeted approach to what you're going to learn and what basically take benign neglect and say I'm not going to really focus on this and if it does come up an exam you're like oh well but you know enough to get through but you're not going to score brilliant marks in it but the areas and you, areas you do want to know you do do well on so I think that's I think a lot of stress is related on people trying to put that as you say the high achievers putting the pressure on themselves yep. and having these um, sometimes unrealistic goals do you talk, or you know, is this a subject that the, you know, do you talk about at RBC as you know officially? Like, do you get training or have conversations with your tutors about stress management, about the what happens beyond graduation? Less so about what happens beyond graduation, but um, throughout the year, they the university provides people to go and talk to about whether it's about exam stress or money stress or personal stress yep. whatever kind of problems you're having they like at the moment they started sending weekly emails to us saying there's a drop in and chat session come and drop in and chat and whatever it is that you want to chat about if it's going to help you de-stress then great um so they're obviously are really good at promoting a healthy mindset kind of thing yep. um and obviously everyone um, get stressed about different things and everyone has different views on the course and their future plans and everything like that so I'm the kind of person that doesn't get stressed about really anything until it comes to the day before exams and I'm like oh I probably should have worked a bit harder for this <laughs> about oh well so let's see how it goes the exam paper and you're like oh yeah <laughs> and then I stress about it afterwards um but it's too late but um but where, whereas other people will stress all, all year through yep. um, and we'll go home after a lecture and think oh I didn't understand any of that where I'll, whereas I'll be like oh I don't care <laughs> <laughs> you'll be in the uh, student union yeah. bar <laughs> yeah. I think I struggle with it's a sort of control thing for me as well because right. I think most of us probably exams before vet school you would go into the exam and think I do know like pretty much all of this and that gives you quite a lot of confidence. Whereas going into exams now, I know that I don't know the majority of it. And a lot of it I'll be able to sort of retrieve from the back of my mind if it's put in front of me in a multiple choice question. But I can't really predict the level to which I know that. And that really does stress me because it, it does make me feel quite out of control. How do you manage that? Well, I think... I, I was kind of okay in first and second year, and then people who live with me will know that in third year I did not cope at all. Yep. Um, and I think I stressed everyone else out as well because I had a little bit of a meltdown, and I think they all then thought, oh, if she thinks she doesn't know anything, maybe we don't know anything either. So, so it's like a sort of ripple effect. Of <laughs> I think I stressed anxiety. everybody out. Yep. Um, but I have, I've learned now that I need to. I can't work sort of 13 hours a day, which I was doing up to my third year exams. Yep. So I've started revising for these exams quite early, like two months before, and that's purely so that I can work kind of nine to five yep. and then switch off. And then if I'm stressed about something, I do try and like phone my parents or speak to somebody here rather than, I think we've got to be quite careful about unloading on each other because much as we might be unloading ourselves, we might be putting that on the other person right how did you and feel free not to talk about this if you don't want to but mm -hmm. what did your um you know your sort of i'm not going to call it a breakdown or you <laughs> just choose your own words for it um but how did how did the stress manifest itself and how did you recover your way through that because here we are you're almost on the course so yeah you, you dealt with it um so i had been revising with one of the boys that we live with who is super duper intelligent and much more so than I am. Um, and he works very long hours, so he would work 13 hours a day. He's a machine. Yeah, he's an absolute machine. And um, I tried to keep up with him 
and just sort of couldn't. And I wasn't sleeping enough. And because I wasn't winding down before I went to bed, all I could think about when I was dreaming was, so I'd be sort of running through, like, kidney pharmacology in my head, which didn't make sense because I was asleep. And that stressed me out (laughs) because I'd wake up and think, oh, I don't understand this, but it's because I'd been trying to revise in my sleep, which doesn't work. Um, So I was exhausted. I wasn't eating properly. I was just eating ready meals. And it sounds I think like you've remedied that. <laughs> breakfast, lunch, this yeah, quality <laughs> streets are much better. Option. Quality street <laughs> fudge chocolates. So I think about two days before the exam, I just sort of I was feeling quite unwell because I hadn't been sleeping, hadn't been eating properly, okay. and I just thought I don't know anything. My brain is exhausted. I've exhausted my brain. I've completely overloaded it, and it's just everything's fallen out. Yeah. Um, so I had a bit of a cry. I phoned my mum, who said, come home and just sleep for the next two days, um, which is what I did. But I did actually phone my... Well, I emailed my tutor and said, I'm not well, I'm not going to do the exams. Because I was unwell, I had made myself... Yeah. Like, I was being physically sick and things. Um, and it was actually my housemates phoned me up and said, look, you have done all of the revision just do it, like, if you have to resit, it's not the worst thing in the world, yeah. if you don't do this, you're going to be working all through the summer, and you're re- going to really regret it, so I did do the exams, and thank you very much to my housemates, I did pass them, um, but I just, I just overloaded myself, and I have, I have been better since then at kind of managing it, and appreciating that not everyone's the same, and I can't work like... So what were your learnings, what did you take away, and what did you change? to make it more manageable I think this will resonate with a lot of people Um, I think I learnt that I shouldn't try and keep up with other people because not you know everyone works in different ways Um, I learnt that I need to start things earlier so that I can look at everything twice although the second time might just be a very quick read through Um, I also learned that it's important to eat properly. Um, So ready meals for a month is not a healthy way to sustain yourself. (laughs) So other than quality street for breakfast, I do try and sort of make lunch and dinner normally. Um, And just not working in the evenings, I don't think that's good for me because I don't sleep properly. I think, uh, again, we some of us live together um, in first, second year. Um, And in second year, we also had a bit of a difference of opinions in that some people were early early morning people as Nicola was saying before some people like to get up and get things started and work in the morning and then at five o'clock that's it turn off whatever whereas me personally I'd rather sleep until I've woken up and then work until midnight because once I get going, I'm in the zone yeah. and I don't feel tired yeah. and I've had the sleep that I wanted. Yeah. Um, whereas in the morning, I just can't function. So again, if you try and put those two different kinds of people together and try and make them work together, it's just going to be completely yeah. fail. So. so you're having to accommodate to mm-hmm. other people's yeah. patterns. Um, and what I'm hearing is not trying to be somebody you're not test yourselves against people who, you know, who are machines, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the day you get your degree, that's really the only thing that matters. Um, Nicola, you looked like you were you had something to add. Well, I was going to say, Chloe's saying about she makes sure she gets the sleep that she needs by sleeping in in the morning, I, I still get the sleep that I need, I just go to bed yeah. really early compared <laughs> <Right. laughs> to everyone else. Right. Um, and I agree, like, not judging yourself to other people, like, I think I would find it very easy to get very stressed if I tried to revise with Gareth but like you said he is he is setting his target quite high yeah. and I'm a humble pass kind of person so yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think I would be able to remember as much as he does and that would stress me out I wouldn't pass if I didn't know as much but I think I probably know enough to pass but not I wouldn't be able to do what he does so yeah, I agree with just making sure that you okay. stick with what you are Right, so I'm going to segue across, perhaps crunch gears across, into another topic, which is money. Um, you've mentioned it a couple of times already. Out of interest, because I, I know 
what I graduated with as, as debt, which wasn't an awful lot. What is the sort of average debt in the room that you guys would graduate with? Like how much does it cost you to do a veterinary degree these days? Um, so all of us except Gareth, who is lucky, we all have the 9,000 a year fees. Yeah. So mm-hmm. times up by five, like 45 plus. Is that because he's from Kent? <laughs> uh, no, I came in the year before the fee change. Yeah. Uh, and so I indicated so I joined these guys in their year in third year. Yeah. But my previous year group was on the three and a half thousand pound fees. Okay. And I stayed in that the way through. Okay. So so basically, you know, the best part of 50,000. Yeah, well, I think Plus mine was interest. more, when I kind of ha- tried to think of an idea in my head, I thought, because obviously it's not cheap living in the southeast. Yep. I think my estimate was more towards a seventy thousand mark. Yeah. I don't know if that was way off. With living expenses, with living expenses right. and also because we're we're not like a regular course in that you have certainly towards the end of it you don't have consistent holiday where you'll have a huge summer and then you always have Christmas and Easter yeah. and maybe a reading week. We have to be able to pay for ourselves all throughout the summer and fourth yeah. year and then all through till quite late in fifth year so it is quite a financial strain yeah and it also makes it quite difficult to be able to get a job to like right. to earn money at the same time as studying because right. we have like placements and rotations and it's um, i really admire people that do manage to juggle that because yeah. i find it really hard yeah so especially living in camden was ex- incredibly expensive yeah and for those of us that get the minimum amount of loan from the government it doesn't cost it doesn't cover your living costs so for example um, if you get the minimum living in London it's something like five thousand pounds and the average living cost for the year is about seven and a half thousand pounds um, so in my second year my parents decided that they weren't going to pay for me if I wanted to live in London that was my choice um, so I had to work three nights a week in a pub to pay for my rent um, and luckily, in second year, I was able to do that because the course was slightly less intense. But if I'd have had to do that any any of the clinical years, it definitely wouldn't have been possible. How does that affect your decision making when it comes up to time to choose a job? Or does it affect your decision making? It doesn't. Because we all come out with thousands and thousands of pounds worth of debt. And it, you pretty much don't have a choice of how much you pay or whether you pay it or anything like that, it just comes out of your wages yep. and you don't see it. So um, getting a getting a job, however much you get paid, it doesn't really affect the, the loan itself, it doesn't affect it. Okay. Um, but I, I know that when I was looking for a job, I before I accepted the job that I got, I spoke to a lot of people that had other job offers and people in the year above, for example, at what I should be expecting. Yep. Um, so that just so that I wasn't being basically underpaid yeah. um, but the loan didn't really cross my mind at all because it doesn't it doesn't affect the and so that's what repayment how long will it take you to repay that loan I don't even know how we don't know it. no so it how, gets how much do you have to repay a month don't even we don't know. know. We have no idea. <laughs> it's I believe it's percentage, it's, isn't it? It's nine yeah. percent of everything over twenty one thousand. So yeah. if you weren't thirty thousand pounds, you'd pay nine percent. Okay. Nine grand. Of that, I think, think for these guys who are on the, the new scheme as well, it's they're being unfairly hit by their interest rates also a lot higher. Mm-hmm. I think their interest rate is going up about five to six percent now, which is really unfair compared to the previous interest rates with mines up. 1.2 because yeah. the way the loans are changing and it's I got I have to pay back earlier so I have to pay back after 15,000 pounds right um, but it's the new loan system isn't very helpful to people for, to see these guys moving forward when I graduated I think my my initial job offer um, the job I took was for something like 16,000 and I felt like I was going to be the richest person on the planet um, what's and it's going to depend on where you are in the country and what organisation you work for. But what are you averaging in your research then? Um, so I found that I was looking in the southeast, yeah. um, and I found that anywhere kind of from twenty five, twenty six grand up to thirty two ish, yeah. um, depending on whether you go into a private practice or a big corporate practice or. Um, who who pays more, private or corporate? 
the corporate people will pay more um, and obviously you have to consider all the benefits that, that they give you so some places especially for equine and farm for example you'll get given a car um, some places some small animal practices um, you get the flat above the the vet practice um, and things like that so there are other benefits really, um, uh, the dubious benefit of a a, a, a bed close to work could, yeah. that could never be taken to use of you just pop down into those cases could you yeah. um, so let's talk about future employment and employers um, what do you guys want from your job like what are the most important if you had to list out we'll go around the room and ask each of you what are the three most important things that you are looking for in your first role We'll reverse around the room this time. What would those three things be? Um, I think one is support. Like you, you need the the, the the springboard to go and do stuff independently, but you also need to be able to, when you have a question, and even if it's a stupid question, be able to pop out and say, oh, give me a second, let's check something, then go and ask them a bet. I've got this, I'm going to do it the right way, and that's, I think, something very key. And I think that, that requires a practice to have a, a structure behind it, because even if they have senior vets in the practice, if they're busy, they might not be able to help you. So having someone who's going to be around to help you. I think also having a good environment, so having a good team of vets, a good team of nurses, a good team of receptionists, because your first job, you have, if you don't enjoy where you're working, you're not going to enjoy the job. You, if, you don't, if you're not happy with the people around you... Can you define what you mean by good? As in, it's in support, again, it comes to support, but also something you have fun with, like... Um, has a good social atmosphere. It's not you're there, you go in there at eight, you finish at six, and that's it. Somewhere where maybe you can have a bit, well, a bit of banter with, or somewhere where you can have a nice conversation. You, people are generally interested in each other. Not this is work, get through it. The nine to five, some people sitting at a desk, you never talk to the person opposite them. You want some sort of personal inter- interaction. Right. Um, so support, fun. Um, and What's number three. I, I guess. I guess it also has to be challenging. It has to be challenging and enriching, um, and it has to be a good learning opportunity. Um, so building onto it, having opportunities to try things, so having opportunities to do not just do every week to stand and cat castrate, dog castrate for the first two years. When a cesarean does come in, you you scrub in. You might not, you might not do it, or you might assist someone, or they might let you do it with them assisting you. And so having that produce the, the the more fun sort of emergency stuff which you might not get to do because see your best one did. People right. like doing the, the fun, complicated surgery, but allowing you to have that sort of uh, involvement if you want to would probably be something as well. The opportunity probably the best thing to do. Okay. That was like about six. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and Nicola? So I think support is really important. Yep. Um, and I, I, in terms of being prepared for graduating, that is something I worry about because I think there's a fine line between... Um, like being too needy as a new grad I don't want to be needy and having to ask for everything but I definitely want to be able to ask when I need the help because that's quite important yeah. um, and I agree with having colleagues that you do get along with I'm aware that obviously you're never going to get along with everyone but being able to be professional and get over it I know people who um, have had person- personality clashes in their new jobs and I the support network has gone now because their boss doesn't want to talk to them because they don't really like them, which I think is is difficult. And I'm so I think as long as you everyone is professional and like knows that and gets along, that's quite important to okay. me. And a caseload really, there's no point having yep. a really good job and then nothing comes in. Yep. Um, so I'd quite like to work somewhere that is quite busy and busy. I get to see quite a lot because I think that's a good way of learning quite quickly. Okay. Yeah, I definitely agree with all the points that you've said. Um, I think for me, um, we had a careers day, obviously, and they um, some of the corporate places were saying you're going to have a buddy vet, basically, for the first year of your practice. And to me, that was a really big turn off. I don't want to be buddied. I don't want to be babied for the first year of my life. Like, I, I do know something. <laughs> I'm not a complete idiot. Um, but obviously, having the support there is essential, um, being able to ask. And um, for me, the practices that I've wanted to work in are the, pe- are the practices that push you towards getting better and going into finding your interests and pursuing those interests and getting better at a random surgery that you've never done before or um, 
exotics or something yeah. that they, they want to push you to get better at things. Yeah. Um, I think that's really important. Well, I think it's really interesting that nobody has said money. Um, <laughs> and I would agree. For my first year, I think certainly once I feel like I know what I'm doing, I will want to be paid a reasonable amount. But for my first year and my first job, it's really not a priority. Um, so I think I'm applying for internship roles in equine practice, so I know that the money is definitely not going to be a big feature. Um, and that's really because I want that first year to be almost sort of jumping two steps on the ladder rather than one. Um, so I want the support, like everyone has said. Um, I sort of expect that because I'm taking a bit of a, a pay drop, part of what I'll be doing will be being taught. Um so I want the support, I want the teaching, and that teaching I want to come from experienced people, so either certificate holders or diplomats. Um, and to me it's really important to go to a practice that does do things sort of by gold standard. I, I don't want to learn to be cutting corners in my first year. Maybe when I'm sort of 10 years out I'll think, oh I've seen lots and lots of these, it's probably not that necessary that I do this test, but I don't want to start by being lazy so I want to go somewhere where I think that they do everything properly Um, also I really don't like practices where there's um, a very obvious hierarchy so I've been to especially some small animal practices where the nurses but especially the student nurses are treated really badly um, and I really don't like that Um, so I think somewhere that everybody gets on as a team um, and don't sort of put each other down where everyone supports each other I think is really important never upset the nurses <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly cardinal, people do though cardinal <laughs> yeah very wise I want um, so running the risk of sounding like a broken record I want support as well um, I don't want to be sat there all day worrying that if I ask a question they're going to think I'm an idiot or um you know that I'll be expected to do things out of my le- out of my league and things. I want to be able to progress, but I don't want to be made to feel uncomfortable. I don't want to go. To- I've heard. I've spoken to a couple of people in the year above recently who have told me some horror stories about being almost abandoned and they have to do loads of on call um, and they have all of these duties and they're just they're struggling because they can't they can't relax. They're worrying all the time. They go home and they worry, and they get up and they worry. I don't want that. Um, so I want I want support so that I'm not not in that boat um, and yeah I don't want to be somewhere that's a negative environment I want to be happy I don't want to go to work thinking I'd quite like to have a laugh with the people <laughs> I work with you know <laughs> and be able to do things with them outside of work because we don't hate each other <laughs> and stuff like that so it's a big ask there's a big ask you know um, I might have a boss who's really horrible and you know, doesn't let me do anything. <laughs> um, there's, there's a few of them out there. <laughs> um, and I suppose, sadly, um, I mean, I feel like I should probably say something down the academic route, but at the end of the day, I just want to be happy. I want to be somewhere that encourages me to do to have a good work-life balance. So I suppose that does link in with being happy at work. But I don't want to be somewhere that wants me to be a slave. I want to be able to you know go off and do my hobbies and then look forward to going on CPD and coming to work and you know I want to be a person as well I don't want to be sucked in never let out (laughs) (laughs) so mentioned earlier you know it's obviously a lot of competition for your attention as new graduates in the employment space right now so I've got two questions one is um, how do you find your jobs? Like, where do you look? Where do you go? Um, what are the common places? And the other question is um, corporate versus independent. I'm interested in each of your opinions on, you know, pros and cons and which way you would lean if you had the choice. So maybe start with um, question one, and that's or part A. Where where do you look? How do you find jobs? And what do you would say? I've looked at my base practices, so I had two practices I've done. So that's practices you've been, been seeing? Yeah, I think it's 17 weeks of my 20 week, 26 weeks EMS, these two practices. And part of it is Part of one, one, and the other one is the shrubbery in, in which, Norfolk. Which I would highly recommend to you, of course. Uh, um, and, and both of them, that's where I've looked for employment, because I guess 
I could have looked I could have looked all these all these lovely wonderful programs and practices, but I guess I got on both well both teams. I like both practices and they both practice better medicine in the way that I, I want to. So that's the that's the approach I'm going down there and that's why I'm I'm looking to see if there's a possibility of employment. Um, and that's just I guess the way I fall into looking at those two places because I was lucky enough to find very good practices around me from the beginning of third year and I just stuck with them. I quite often look on like the Vet Times jobs and the Vet Record jobs and look at those ones. Um, but I haven't really, I think I'm going to start properly looking for jobs after graduation. I haven't really been that focused on trying to get a job now. Um, so I think I probably have been looking a bit less than everyone else. Yeah. Um, and then I know the area that I want to work in, like as in location. location. Yeah. But I haven't decided small equine or farm yet because yeah. I seem to like them all. So <laughs> probably a mixed job. But um, I think probably when I start, I will then just start sending my CVs to sort of yeah. places in the location that I like and yeah. see what comes up. Yeah, again, as Gareth said, you, a, a lot of people, especially small animal um, practices, you, you're going to go to EMS at places that you like working in and the yeah. people that you like, that you get on with. So I was lucky enough to be approached by the practice that I did a lot of my EMS at and they offered me the job um, kind of fairly straight out. Um, so I was lucky... Could, could you do a bit <laughs> No. Uh, maybe. But they've seen me do enough of them. Um, uh, for the record, uh, I mean, that's an absolutely awful <laughs> recruitment policy. But. Um, but yeah, so I was lucky enough that um, I didn't have to do a lot of searching, um, but I think it also benefits the practice employing someone that they know, um, that they know how they've worked, they either get on with them or they don't. Um, obviously it's not their choice whether you keep coming back to them, they kind of just say yes to everyone, but um, at least they they know how you work and whether you're going to suit and right. fit in with everyone. So right. I think that that's one of the main ways that people find practices. So we've got Practices you've been embedded in EMS, sort of mm-hmm. geographic search, bedtimes, any other ways? I've looked on um, Beaver Jobs, which is like an equine specific one, obviously. Um, and although I do That's look. B E V A, as yeah. opposed to for a annoying animal that creates damage. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, the, the former. Um, and I do sort of scroll through Vet Record and Beaver Jobs. Um, almost as a sort of procrastination tool but actually <laughs> the only the only places that I have applied to have been places that I have been to mm-hmm. and that does seem to be the case for a lot of people so although people spend an awful lot of money putting these nationwide adverts out I think the vast majority of people are much more likely to consider somebody somewhere that they have been. Mm-hmm. Um, okay yeah. so then that moves nicely into the second half of the question which is sort of independent corporate maybe that's framing it wrong way because it, it shouldn't be a versus situation but let's you know what are the pros and cons of each and what are your opinions um what, what, what would you prefer to be in and, and why let's go to the reverse round and start there. um i think for me i wasn't really thinking about it as corporate versus independent i was more thinking about the actual place kind of as on its uh, on its own, like if I like that practice, regardless. Um, I suppose I like the thought of being independent because, you know, it's just kind of what we're used to. I suppose a little bit. My pet's always been to independent. It's a little family practice type thing, and you can maybe be a partner at the end of it. Um, corporate, I suppose, is becoming such a big thing now. Um, they offer all of these. Um, graduate programs which are all fantastic and offer you loads of deals and I suppose um, maybe there's a different kind of route of career progression through those but for me it was just more about the practice on its own and whether I liked it or not certainly to start off with. Um, it's funny because I remember when corporate started becoming a bigger thing when we were maybe doing work experience or in first and second year I thought I will never work for a corporate no I, they are the devil. Mm-hmm. But what, what made you feel like that? I don't know, I just felt like it was sort of the McDonald's of vet practices. <laughs> yeah. um, but I definitely don't feel that way anymore, having done EMS and things at, at corporate um, practices. But I do think that 
although there are big advantages like a lot of them have quite structured new grad programs very structured CPD structured support systems um, and I think a lot of them offer quite good work-life balance and so I think I'd be much more attracted to working at a practice that although it might be owned by a corporate sort of has um, its own personality and keeps maybe the branding and things like that of perhaps the practice that it was before it was bought rather than um, maybe a practice that comes under a big brand name and everything is all very obviously part of a much bigger um, sort of syndicate um, and perhaps it's unfair but to my mind a lot of the practices that are owned by a corporate but keep their own personality and their own the way that they want to run things as they would have done before um, it seems like you have more kind of clinical autonomy and do things a bit more the way that you want to um, rather than I think some of the the bigger branch practices um, it can feel a bit more like you sort of follow a protocol and just sort of go through the steps that they want you to take rather than doing things the way that you would want to do them. Yeah I mean I haven't really worked in uh, corporate practices at all. Um, I've only really worked in private practices because that's what I like and that's how it suits me. But um, when we've been um, advertised, um, for example, at the careers fair by um, corporate companies, they do provide a really good support um, network and they tell you exactly what their new graduate program is going to be and okay you're going to be buddied for the next six months or a year or whatever and some for some people that's exactly what they want they want to know what the next year of their life is going to look like um, so in that way I think it, it really suits up some people um, for example if I go into a private practice I might not know what I'm going to be doing in the next six months I might still be at the same level that I was when I joined um, so there are positives and negatives to both I think. Yeah. I don't know how true it is but you hear the stories of w that you're told what how to do it and you don't really make all your decisions yourself which w might be good as a new grad and then you, you know that you're following the right steps and you know what you're doing but then it, I can imagine that you might get a bit bored of that when you want to start doing things yourself. I think, as we mentioned, they offer they offer some fantastic practice. If they are true what they say in the structure they offer, it's really nice. To a lot of people, I know it's not everyone like it, but a lot of people would like that. And it's quite similar to maybe what the junior doctors get in their foundation years. A lot more structured support. Maybe that's a way vets the vet profession needs to go because we have this drop out of vets after five years because they haven't had the support and progression. It's maybe allowing that progression there. Um, but I think it's I think for me personally, the key things I want is. I want the practice in the team that I know and I get on well with because that's that's keeping for me. And also, I'd like to have a level of clinical independence. I don't, I, I don't even particularly like when practices have a practice policy. We will use this pre-med and this these drug these doses these drugs, and we'll give them this time because if we spent five years training from vets. Then you go out into a workplace where you're not treated as a vet. You're treated as a robot. You will do exactly what we say. And I think I'd rather be able to. Oh no, this dog I know is a bit of a wimp, so I want to give it a stronger painkiller. But you have to fight a lot more. Certain practices say, oh, I want to, you must give a shot of antibiotic after every surgery. I'm like, well, no, I don't think it required this one. Or you must use this particular antibiotic. So, well, actually, no, I don't think this is working. I want to try this. And there's these, I want to have that ability and freedom to go, I think this is what I want to do with my best. And I might get it wrong. And these protocols might be better in the sense that you get things the right way. And if they're well made, they're well structured, they're probably good. But protocols have a habit of getting in place and never changing. Yeah. And I want to be an ability to adapt. I read something in the record or in fact is saying new approach to treating renal disease and go, okay, cool, this is new. I'm going to try that. But if you have a protocol where you use this, 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 it takes a lot of evidence for that protocol to be changed and then you could be a couple of years behind and you're not giving yeah. what you might deem as the gold standard to your patients. And the bigger your organisation, the harder yeah. that change becomes to get consensus on it. Yeah. So let's talk about aspirations. Um, what do you want your life to look like five years from now? Maybe that's too far. Maybe it's 12 months from now. Um, you 12, can answer it the way you want. 12 months from now, I'd like to be happily settled and have a good platform to hopefully in the future look at reinvesting in further training. Um, I am quite interested in doing the, the specialism routes because I think that will allow me to go. I, I like that, give me the new challenges and allow me to do what I want to do in that, in that environment that I like working. 
um, having the facilities, having the staff around you, which a lot of times the referral hospitals can have, but you don't always get in general practice because there's a cost thing yeah. and stuff like that. And I think I'd like to have a good grounding now. I could be looking to be a competitive candidate for sort of competitive internship programmes, yeah. hopefully. Um, no, I hope that I will have a job that I'm happy in um, and that, that I'm not worried. I don't want to be worrying about lots of things all the time. I hope that uh, obviously in a year I'm not going to become the best vet ever but I hope that like the routine things that I know what I'm doing and I, um, I'm i definitely progressing and I'm getting better um, and then I maybe start thinking about certificates or something but I think I want to make sure that I find something that I know that I want to do a certificate in first and yeah. I need to, I seem to like everything too much at the moment, I need to pick something and be good at that and I hope that in a year's time, I would have worked out what I'm best at. It's forever been um, odd to me that you have to choose at the age of, certainly the age of 15 or 16, what you want to do for the rest of your life when you are so utterly clueless about what life even means. <laughs> and that doesn't resolve. <laughs> you're, probably, you're probably only just coming into some focus now, just past 40, um, but that might just be me. Um, and also that when you are setting out, having gotten your degree, to then narrow in on something also seems like a weird thing. So it sounds like a smart play. Um, okay, Chloe. Hopefully, want to be in the same job that I have got been offered. Um, in five I, years or in in, in a year, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, in five years too. But, right. Um, and actually, let me interrupt you there because another interesting question pops in my brain that I've heard numerous times from employers about one of the reservations people have about hiring new graduates is all the work that goes into training a new graduate and then they leave after 12, 18 months, two years tops. How do you feel when you hear something like that? I'm interested because you, mm. you, know, you sound like you want to stick around. Yeah, it. Um, I think the if you find the right place that suits you, that you can imagine yourself being in for the rest of your life, then it it benefits you sticking to it because you can work up uh, if there is a hierarchy. You can work up the hierarchy and um, be on the same level as the people that taught you. Yeah. Um, but whereas if I I know a lot of new grads do chop and change, but that a lot of that is because they started off in in a job that wasn't for them. Um, and personally, I feel like if I've spent eight weeks at somewhere I'm hoping that I'm going to know what it's like and I'm hoping that I'm going to know that I enjoy working there but you don't know in six months time you could turn around and say actually my boss is not the person who I thought he was and I want to leave but I'm hoping that's not the case. Yeah. I think it depends a little bit as well um, in how you're viewed when you start so I think I wouldn't want to stay in a practice if all the clients saw me as the newbie and they saw especially on like farm when you are going and like on your fertility visits there's another vet there that's then teaching you if they're watching you be taught as long as once you can do it it moves on that they start seeing that you are able to do it as long as you're not always seen as the baby um because i think i'd be inclined to move somewhere else where clients would then see me as a vet rather yeah. than the new guy and i guess from that some of the really nice really good practice people to work with they're already quite saturated in that middle to see a vet position because people are there, they want to stay there. So there's this lack of ability to progress. There's like, it's the opportunity. Like I'd hope, I'm really interested in surgery, that a year, year and a half down the line, I'm doing more, uh, what we see more advanced than the day one surgery. It's more advanced, you normal cash rates, you know, normal stuff like that. To be doing maybe the pyres, maybe doing a bit of orthopedics work, maybe doing the more complicated stuff. And if there's already vets who already capitalised on that part of the practice, I might have to move elsewhere to get the opportunity. And so I think, I think it, would, it really depends on where you go and you never know what life changes. Like I might decide that if I wanted to go work in Northern Scotland for a year and actually, because I wanted the isolation, I wanted to be on my own, then realise six months online, it's not for me and I want to move back down south. And that's a lot of people, you don't know at age 24 where you want to end to spend the next six months of your life, yet alone the next five mm -hmm. years because we've all, right. been, we've all been stuck at university we've all been in the same area now suddenly we can go in and particularly people who've done places like the Navley you've got not just the access to the UK and where the RCVS degree gets you you've also opened the whole of North America yeah. 
and an opportunity to go, I want to go and spend these two years working in California and just slowly moving down the coast of California and then coming back. But I'll do it after I've done a year or so in practice here so I really set my skills up. Um, I think with the thing about new grads not sticking around in a practice, it's a couple of things. And I think one of them is breaking that other people's view of you as being the new grad and that goes for the staff as well as the clients. But the other thing is I think your priorities in a job are very different from your first year in practice to maybe your next five. So for my first year in practice, although all my family lived down south, if the right job was in Yorkshire, I would move to Yorkshire. So I want the support and I don't care where it is, I don't really care how much money I'm being paid for it. But once I feel like I'm at a level where I am a decent vet, those things will matter more. Um, and I will want to be sort of nearer to my family. I will want to be being paid a decent amount. Um, and, yeah, the other factors come into it an awful lot more when you feel like you know what you're doing a little bit. And if there are any equine intern positions <laughs> in Yorkshire, then Molly is available for hire. <laughs> <laughs> Emma? Um, I guess I've heard from, I've been speaking to people in here above recently, kind of, about the whole job situation. And I think from what I've gathered from that is a lot of people, you know, there's almost a bit of a surge of people in our stage of uni who want to find a job and they panic and they accept a job and they think, yeah, fine, this will, this will fit me for a bit. And then you might realise six months down the line that actually it's not what they told you it was going to be. Um, you're not receiving the support you were hoping for. Or I've, I've spoken to someone who has just found that out of hours just does not work. It's not her thing. And I think for me, in a year's time, I, I don't want to have been struck off. And <laughs> I don't want to have lost any of my sanity or dignity. <laughs> but... It was the wrong degree. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the dignity. But I think people just sometimes maybe don't have the right, um, don't realise what they're, what they're kind of getting into. I suppose especially if you haven't done EMS or placement at that place that you've accepted a job at, you might get a bit of a rose tinted glasses view of what it's like when you go there for an interview or, or something, and then it's actually you realise that everyone hates each other and. <laughs> It's hideous and you just have to get out of there. Building on what you mentioned earlier, that new graduates are this really lucrative like employment prospect for new grad uh, for new fa- for practices. I think there is an ability and I think I must say there clearly that they, they sell you this package that it sounds amazing, but it might take six months to realise it's not what it says on the tin. Right. Like my dad's been through that, like he um he moved got jobs and he said, I'll oh, six months it's not actually exactly what they said it was. And he's fine, he, he's, he's adapted to it and he, he, he's in a position that's the honesty to change things to actually make it what he wanted. But um, for us as new graduates, that's, it's very easy we get sold this lovely dream of come work for us, we give you all these, all these benefits, and you go, yeah, why do I sign? And then you realise six months online, you're not, even you're not receiving them all, it's not quite as, as uh, lovely as they've initially made out. Moving from sort of aspirations, what are your... You know, what are your big fears? Like, what's your, what's your number one fear? Let's just go around the room. What's, what's the thing that keeps you awake at night as graduation day approaches? I suppose, um, yeah, like I said earlier, I don't, I don't know where I am in relation to everyone else. And I suppose I would be worried that I would just be terrible. <laughs> I think that everyone has the fear of that one dreaded mistake that you make, for example, I don't know, going into spay a male cat or something like it happens these things happen but it's that thing that you never ever want to do or having a having a spay that bleeds I've never seen one but everyone says it happens to you at some point and it's just going to be that dreaded fear of when when is that going to happen to me I'm scared about not knowing the answer to an owner's question and I know that there are going to be questions that I won't know the answer to um, but if it's something that I think I should know, it will really upset me if I don't. <laughs> <laughs> See previous second year for details. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me just look up my lecture notes. <laughs> I'm really worried about choosing the wrong job and ending up in a job that's clearly not right for me um, and hating it. I really don't want to hate my job. Mine's very similar to Emmett's, just not 
like not I want to try and live up to this like idea so I want to be I want to be a good vet I think we all want to be a good vet and realising at graduation when you actually challenge to do it yourself I don't want to fall below the standards I've set myself and like I want to be able to try and just offer as good as care as possible and I know I just don't want to be feel like I'm not be, I'm not able to live with that and not because of where I work not where I work it's because I, I just feel useless I don't want to be useless I don't want to be part of a team where I feel like the team have dragged me along because I want to be able to contribute to it I'm not saying be able to do everything in the practice and be the best vet in the world but I want to be able to help vets I want to be able, I want to, be able to give a positive impact to my clients and I don't want to be dragging that down okay so you usually end up these conversations with some more sort of the you know, sort of rapid fire questions so and we'll just go around maybe once and you don't have to give short answers by the way you can give as long an answer as you like and I'll not ask a bunch of the normal ones you would ask because you're just at the start of your career so you can't go back and give yourself advice and so normally I ask people what advice would you give yourself back at the start of your career and some of the answers are really interesting so let's flip it around for some fun and go if you can put something or maybe it's a tweet or it's a bit of paper or something in a time capsule and beam that forward to yourself in four years time what would it say what would you hope what, what thing would you want to hold on to the most throughout your career you're living the dream you're living the, dr- <laughs> living the dream baby. because Let's go. Uh, we all want to be vets from so young yep and i think then you have days where you're like oh what am i doing this is i don't know why i'm doing this and you I just want to remind myself that, like, child me would be really pleased. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. That was what they wanted to do. That's powerful. I think I say, like, have one, like, live your life because it's all well and good, this is what you want to do, but if you don't, if you, if you invest your whole life and you don't live a life, what's, what's the point of doing it? It's, you need to be able to have a work-life balance, have ability, don't neglect your friends, don't neglect your family, don't, like, oh, no, I can't see my friends, I can't go out, I can't get this work done. No, because people around you that make... A, your job worth, li- worth doing and your life worth living. So. Okay, and, and it's on audio and will be on the internet forever, so you can <laughs> check back in with these things in 40 years. And you guys got something you want to add there? Yeah, going along with Nicola, like, be proud of yourself. Um, thousands of people applied for your place and you got it and you completed the five years and there are thousands of children that look up to you and think, oh my God, that's the person that I want to be. Um, so be proud of yourself. I think mine would be don't ever get lazy and I think that I've definitely had times when I've had sort of I've been in the small animal hospital for 12 hours and I've got paperwork still to do and I want to look back and think yes I've treated every animal that I have seen as if it were my own you know I would be happy if this was my pet and I'd taken it to the vet and they treated it exactly as I had because it is important it's so important um, you know, not only for the animal, but for the, the client and the owner. Um, so, yeah, I'll be proud of myself if I can hand on heart say that I've treated every animal as if it was my own. I'd probably say, stop worrying. You're doing great, unless you're in the afterlife. <laughs> <laughs> in which case, you won't care. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. OK, I'm not going to ask all of you all of these questions, but has anyone got... The next question is, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received uh has anyone gotten some epically good advice that has stood them you know, stood them in good ground thus far wear sunscreen wear sunscreen <laughs> 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 seriously feel like we need backstory on that. <laughs> it's that song it's isn't song. it basil it's like wear sunscreen <laughs> <laughs> and okay so has anyone had some epically bad advice that is just completely set them in a tailspin or a bad place. I'm getting a nod from Chloe. I've been told to stop asking too many questions. Oh um, yeah, that's shocking. Yeah, um, that set me back a bit because it put me in a position where we've been told for our entire lives to never be afraid to ask a question yep. um, and to be told to shut up was a bit of a shock. Um, so I then went into a bit of a mindset of, okay, when am I meant to ask a question? Um, is it a stupid question? Or... So that, that wasn't great. Advice. That is shocking. Yeah. Advice. When I, I have a slide whenever I'm speaking and it's got the house rules on it. <laughs> and, and one of them, it says, no stupid questions. Mm-hmm. Like, and it's deliberately meant to be you know, 
that you can interpret that one of two ways, right? But it means there are no stupid questions, ask whatever you like. Um, because I am like a champion of dumb ask your questions and always have been and probably why I'm where I am today. So um, okay, if you could give one piece of advice to future employers, what would the advice be? Just really try and remember when you were at that stage. Because I think it's so easy for people, and I noticed this on EMS as well, they said, what, you don't know that? I was like, no, I don't know that. I've only been doing this for three years. You've been doing this for 20 years. You probably didn't know that at my stage either. Um, so I do think it's really important for people to sort of come down from their pedestal sometimes and put themselves back where they were at your stage in your career. Any others? Um, probably just give me a chance and try really hard. <laughs> you know, I think, you know, certainly... I'm not the only one who's mentioned about being worried about, you know, how we're doing. Um, I think recognising that we're all trying our best and, you know, we're only going to get better and we're going to make mistakes and that we're going to improve on and, yeah, I suppose everyone's been in the same boat, so... Yeah, try and, um, for every mistake that you point out that we've done, try and give us a positive thing as well. Yeah. I guess preferably be, seven to one. <laughs> yeah. I guess be patient because I'm. It's the same with like asking questions and things. I'm terrified of being told to stop asking too many questions. But at the same time, obviously, I do need to remember that, like, hopefully, I will have passed exams and do know something, and I should be able to rely on myself a bit. But just be patient that sometimes I will ask questions that will seem a bit silly, but hopefully, I won't do it as often as time goes on. <laughs> I guess if you do make a mistake, teach me why I made a mistake and how to avoid making a mistake again because the worst thing to do is tell me I made a mistake and then leave me there. Like, okay, well, and I'll make it again because it should be, it should be a teaching opportunity. We're not going to stop learning if we left vet school. If anything, it's probably the time we're going to learn the most, so we need their support. So I'm getting empathy, I'm getting support, I'm getting patience, I'm getting feedback. Like, I think you just gave future employers the playbook for how we can you guys, which is awesome. Um, okay, we're going to leave it there. Thank you, each of you. It's been absolutely brilliant. So, Emma, Molly, Chloe, Nicola, Gareth, awesome. Thank you for your time. Very best luck in your finals. Good luck starting your careers. And uh, you're going to be amazing. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, hello, listener. Me again, very briefly. Thank you so much for listening to Blunt Dissection. I hope you enjoyed it and learned some great stuff. I would really like to keep bringing you these podcasts. What I need from you is just a little bit of feedback. Who would you like to hear on the show? Send me your thoughts, uh, your ideas, uh, and you can do that on my Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash Dr. Dave Nicol. Don't forget to like me there as well. And if you do enjoy the podcast, please, pretty please, with a large cherry on the top, leave me a review on iTunes. That goes a long way to making sure that people see the podcast, listening to it, and therefore me make more of them. Thanks for listening.